which is on in cinemas around the country. The myth itself is at least 3,000 years old. The monstrous minotaur, half bull, half man, imprisoned in a labyrinth devouring human hostages. It's fascinated artists through the centuries, from Homer to Picasso and Borges. Now Harrison Birtwistle, often described as Britain's greatest living composer, has created his own version for the Royal Opera. The librettos by poet David Harsent, with whom he's collaborated on several occasions, including their last opera for Covent Garden, Gawain. The role of the Minotaur was specially created to suit the voice of John Tomlinson. Ariadne, played by Christine Rice, is first seen on a lonely beach, prefiguring her later abandonment by Theseus. It's through, through music that you can deal in, in myth in a very particular way. When you take a subject like the Minotaur, or you take a subject like Orpheus, um, there is a known quality that coming in off the street, there's a, there's a, a degree of foreknowledge and, um, and so it is a question of finding a language for that and the form. People might think they can, they can see the difference between the bestial side and the human side. Um, in fact, they're inextricably joined, but one is not necessarily the virtuous and, and, and the other, um, you know, the, the, the terrifying terrible. I think I see the Minotaur as being the only true innocent in the piece. Rapacious and, and murderous, of course, but, but the first sight of him, I think, is this kind of really stark, tragic figure. The received information for the Minotaur is the animal. You look at the top half, you don't look at the bottom half. Um, it is, you, you think, bull. Tony, a new Harrison Birtwistle a lot for us. Pretty impressive event. What did you think of it? I thought the uh, the Minotaur himself looked like one of the runners in the London Marathon. You know, the people that dress up as uh, camels or chickens, and you know, you say that doesn't look anything like a chicken. Um, I really enjoyed it dramatically. I thought it was an, an incredible piece of theatre. I really loved the, you know, the. I mean, it's got two moods really bleak despair and screaming terror and it seems to go back but it's such a such a, I mean, it's such a powerful myth, myth and it's such a brilliant story uh, anyway but it was really well done the innocence on the beach waiting for their to be fed to this to this beast um, the black sows of death I, re I really loved all that um, you know I, mean, I struggled with the music I struggled you know Britain's greatest living composer I'm struggling I, I really enjoyed it for three hours I really enjoyed it but I you know I remembered my father holding the cover of the first New York Dolls album and really wanting to understand, really wanting to get it and saying, but it's not music, is it? But it's not music. And I can't, Britain's greatest living composer, I don't, I don't remember any of it. Did you find the music a barrier? I thought I would. Actually, I, no, I think if I'd had just the music on its own, loud on my iPod, I would have loved it. For me, the singing kept interrupting it. I could not, I obviously don't have an ear to understand how that singing went with that music, so that was completely inaccessible for me. And I sort of agree with Tony, I, I thought it was well done. And every, there were lo lots of things I liked about it. I think it's beautifully designed by Alison Chitty. Um, you, the, the, the sea that you see photographically, a sort of film of the sea looking just wrong, sort of leaden. It's very powerful at the beginning. But I just wasn't enjoying myself. I was waiting for it to end. What about the interpretation of the myth, Joe? the idea that is more focusing on the more human side of the Minotaur than the bull. There was the that sense movie that he was that... dreaming as a man but didn't have a, the voice of a man. There was that movie that came out last year called Beowulf, which is you've got the story all wrong. It's not about the Grendel. It's about Grendel and Beowulf is not the hero. And it's Frankenstein's monster all over again. Let's look at it from the point of view of the monster, which is okay idea. But as far as the music goes, um, you know, at the very end of the thing, um, the eight harpies come out and they have their faces smeared with blood because they've been eating the hearts of the victims and the stage managers come out and give them bouquets of flowers and everybody's going brave brave and I thought you know 
I've really enjoyed the trip to the asylum, but you know, I have to go home now because everybody is on their best behavior. The same person next to me who described it at intermission as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre then is going brave, brave. And it's because people are afraid to say, this is horrible. There's no music in it. It's sound effects. It's, it's, it's just Tony. the kind of thing you hear in movies. Tony. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I, I mean, I don't, um, I just don't get the music. I just don't understand. I mean, I really would love to be able to appreciate it, and um, and I don't. And I, I agree. I agree with Joe. I think there's a bit of a contract being perpetrated. I thought, um, although is that I, really fair? That, I mean, you know, Harrison Bertwistle talks about it. He talks about um, you know, the saxophone being um, Ariadne's instrument. It comes in. It's, it has the exact range as her voice as a mezzo soprano. I mean, there's a cleverness well, there, isn't there? Yeah, but you don't. Look, the, the, the thing is, you don't. To, you don't need anybody to explain guys and dolls no, to you. You don't need anybody to explain West Side Story. Or but but why do we be, need? But does everything have to be as easy as that? But why? No. But why no, should it be a struggle? This this, why should this, this is, loving why, music be a struggle? You have to work at this, don't you? But for me, one of the problems is, you know, why haven't they learnt to sing so we can hear the words and not have to have these surtitles up there? Because at some time you can hear the words when they sing. I sort of that would have really improved it for me because actually it's a beautiful libretto. I think I, some I of the words actually, are fantastic. Would the, would the, what about performances, John Tomlinson, where we hear him? Half roaring as a beast, like half singing. Yeah, I, I mean the singers are great. The singers, I mean the singers have to perform. And the thing is, at the end, I always applaud for these people because they've worked so hard. But. I've been going to the opera since 1968, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired. This isn't new music. This is music that's been going on since the 1930s. It's, we are going to force you to listen to unpleasant sounds for two and a half hours. I can go to the subway and listen to them. If you want to know, you know, people say, is classical music dead or dying? Okay. Go to Covent Garden and you can view the corpse. <laughs> Strong stuff, Joe. Well, the Minor Tour continues in rep at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden until the 3rd of May, and we'll be broadcast on BBC Radio 3 on the 31st of May at half past six. Thanks to my guests, Tony Parsons, Julie Myerson and Joe Queenan. I'll be back with a review next Friday at 11 with items including Gone with the Wind, the musical. And Jeremy will be here with Newsnight on Monday. For more details and links for both programmes, do have a look at our website. Until then, from Emily and me and all the team, have a very good weekend. <laughs>